All right, so in this video, we're going to focus in on uh, glycolysis to start with. Get a little bit more detail than what you can get out of this diagram here. We're going to look specifically at the mechanism for producing ATP in glycolysis, a process called substrate level phosphorylation. And then we'll look briefly at two alternatives to glycolysis, one that's common and one that's considerably less common. All right, glycolysis can be broken into two major stages. It's, it's got 10 steps total. When I say steps, what I mean are 10 different enzymes. There are 10 enzymatically catalyzed steps in this biochemical pathway. We're going to start with glucose, a six carbon sugar. Let's see if I can get my arrow here. Our six carbon glucose, and in the end, we're going to end up with two three carbon pyruvic acids. Pyruvate, pyruvic acid, same term. If I go back and forth, I apologize. So our six carbons in glucose will then be found in these six carbons here in pyruvate. It's going to take 10 enzymatic steps to get there. Do not memorize the names of the enzymes. Do not memorize all of the intermediates. I will show you which ones you need to know as we go along. The first five steps are often referred to as the energy investment stage. What we're going to do is we're going to take this glucose and we're going to destabilize it, and it's going to cost us two ATPs to destabilize it. It's in a pretty stable state. If you take glucose, put it in water, it's pretty happy, even if oxygen's around. It's not going to break down uh, on its own at room temp. If we add a couple ATPs, we can phosphorylate the glucose. Phosphorylation is a common way to destabilize a molecule. And through these two phosphorylations and three other steps, <clears throat> we're going to dephosphorylate it and split it into two molecules called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. They are also three carbons each. So we went from our six carbon glucose to two phosphorylated three carbon molecules, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. This is one you probably should be familiar with, two G3Ps. Uh, and you should know how to spell this out as glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Where did my pointer go? There it is again. <clears throat> In the second half, our energy conserving stage, we're going to take our two G3Ps and we're going to essentially just rearrange them into these two pyruvates because these are already three carbon molecules and we're going to rearrange them into these three carbon molecules. But these rearrangements will be energy yielding. We're going to get our initial two ATPs back here, or pardon me, our two, initial two phosphates are going to come off and be used to drive phosphorylation of two ATPs by substrate level phosphorylation. And then in step number 10, we'll get two more ATPs out of this process. So it costs us two up front, but then we get four out the backside, and therefore we're going to net two ATPs per glucose. So if we think about the whole process, we've got a six carbon glucose, gets split first into two three carbon glyceraldehyde three phosphates, which then get rearranged into two three carbon pyruvates. We're going to net two ATPs, Invested two, got four out the back end, and therefore netted two. And then two NADHs. NADHs, we mentioned earlier in an earlier video, are high-energy electron carrier molecules. NAD plus is a coenzyme. You've already learned about coenzymes. There's a class of enzymes called dehydrogenases that require NAD plus to work. When a dehydrogenase strips high-energy electrons off a molecule, it hands two electrons and one proton to its NAD+, which then releases from that enzyme. Those NADHs then are carrying a pair of high-energy electrons, and they're going to deliver them to the electron transport chain where they're going to be used to produce even more ATPs. So we've just now produced a net of two ATPs by a process I mentioned called substrate-level phosphorylation. What does that mean? Substrate refers to one of the organic molecules that's an intermediate in the pathway. It's a substrate of the enzyme. The enzymes involved in substrate level phosphorylation have two binding sites in their active site. They have one for the phosphorylated substrate, in this case phosphoenol pyruvate, PEP. It's a phosphorylated carbon molecule. And another pocket for an ADP molecule then that enzyme is going to cleave the phosphate from the substrate. Now that's a catabolic reaction. When we cleave something off of something, we're breaking it down further, we're increasing the entropy, and therefore we're going to give off energy. The energy that's released by cleaving this phosphate here on the left, I can't get my pointer back, 
by cleaving this phosphate on the left is going to be used to covalently attach the phosphate to the ADP, giving us ATP. So really, all substrate-level phosphorylation is, is taking a phosphorylated intermediate, transferring the phosphate from that intermediate to ADP, releasing phosphate and the unphosphorylated or dephosphorylated carbon molecule. And look, this happens to be pyruvate. So think about it for a minute. Which enzyme is this? In that, that diagram I gave you of 10 steps in glycolysis, which enzyme is this? This is enzyme number 10, isn't it? Go back and look at that and see how we know from this picture that this happened, this example they've given us is enzyme number 10. So that's an example of substrate level phosphorylation. Now before we move on to the Krebs cycle, we need to first look at two alternatives to glycolysis. The pentose phosphate pathway is common among a lot of different living things, including bacteria. Now, I'm going to tell you it's also called the phosphogluconate pathway. Again, I don't expect you to know that for my class, but you may see it on a standardized test someday, so it's probably worth tucking that one away. We're just going to call it the pentose phosphate pathway. Pentose phosphate pathway is common in, in microorganisms that already also have a glycolysis pathway, so it becomes an alternative depending on the conditions. And if you look at this, what happens is a 6-carbon glucose is rearranged into two different possible molecules, ribose 5-phosphate or erythrose 4-phosphate. So ribose is a sugar, erythrose is a different sugar. We're just rearranging our glucose into either ribose or erythrose, and we're phosphorylating it. Why would we do that? Well, ribose 5-phosphate is an important precursor for building nucleotides. And erythrose 4-phosphate is an important precursor for building amino acids. In the process of, 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 of rearranging our glucose into ribose 5-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate, we get one ATP per glucose. That's half of what we saw with glycolysis. And it is by substrate-level phosphorylation. And then we get two high-energy electron carriers called NADPH. It's a phosphorylated version of NADH. Now, NADH is going to be able to donate its electrons to the electron transport chain. NADPH cannot donate electrons to the electron transport chain, but what it can do is it can supply electrons for building new molecules. If you think about that, if you want to build new molecules, you have to create new bonds. Bond, covalent bonds represent shared electron pairs. Easiest way to provide those electron pairs for creating new bonds is with NADPH. So think for a few minutes about when an organism that has glycolysis and has the pentose phosphate pathway as options, when it would switch from glycolysis over to pentose phosphate, under what conditions would it make more sense to operate this pathway versus glycolysis? All right, the other alternative to glycolysis I want to show you is called the Entner-Duderoff pathway. This is much less common. I gave three examples of genera of bacteria that appear to have an Entner-Duderoff pathway, Pseudomonas, Escherichia, and Enterococcus. In this case, glucose is rearranged into either two pyruvates, right? Looks just like glycolysis in that sense, or a series of unique anabolic precursors. Anabolic means biosynthesis, right? Precursor molecules for building stuff. Energetically, the cell gets an ATP per glucose, just like we saw with pentose phosphate, and two NADPHs. So again, think about when an organism that has this option would want to use this option. When would it want to split its glucose into pyruvate versus splitting it into anabolic precursor molecules? Under what conditions would glycolysis be favored over these or these favored over glycolysis?